Welcome to Literary Hangover. I'm your host, Matt Leck. With me, once again, is Alex Guns. Hello. Hey, Alex. Uh, today, it's a little intro. We we had this discussion about the Maypole of Marymount. I think I might get the title wrong once or twice in the in, in the actual recording itself instead saying the Maypole on Marymount. You know what? Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne himself got... It's not even Marymount, as we discovered. It's Ma Re Mount, which means by the sea. And he, and as we see, which is my critique, is he made it frivolous and <laughs> called it Marymount. Uh, but w- w- now that I've already gone in on Hawthorne a little bit, I wanted to talk about this comment sent by uh, Mateo Riveros. Uh, and he says, he commented on the, uh, on the YouTube page. Check it out. Literary Hangover is on YouTube. Uh, he commented here. He says, hi, Matt. Really like in the podcast, I don't think early American literature has been looked at deeply enough in its historical cultural context. Also, really appreciate all the work you do writing titles for the majority of port clips on YouTube. I don't usually do that. I'm doing it this week, but that's usually somebody else. Uh, I may be biased as a little bit of a thorn head, and I love that you're talking about his work regardless of whether I agree or not. But I think you guys kind of missed the mark on this one. Uh, it seemed to me like you guys have a bit of an antagonistic view of him that isn't really accurate. Hawthorne was very much against the Puritans, not writing in favor of them, and if I'm not mistaken, he was ashamed of the direct family connection to the witch trials, which is why he decided to add the W to his name so that it was no longer honoring his great-grandfather. Now, I've heard that speculation, too. I don't think there's a definite documentation of that uh, being the reasoning, but he continues, Hawthorne was very much a man of his times, and living in his mostly affluent and sleepy area of New England, he was also very much sheltered from the reality of some of the more pressing issues of his time. Uh, His anti-Civil War status was very heavily informed by his friendship with Thoreau, and they were staunchly against war in any form. Thoreau's civil disobedience lays out his stance, uh, and it's helped form many of the nonviolent movements that have been successful since the essay was written. Hawthorne wrote in a kind of snarky... S- also, I, I don't know that that's necessarily true. I think Hawthorne was the least radical of the sort of Concord intellectuals. Uh, I know Emerson em- em- Emerson specifically said that uh, th- that uh, ki- the killing of John Brown was going to glorify the uh, gallows like putting Jesus on the cross did for the cross. Yeah, the... Uh Thoreau did the um, plea for John Brown, but both Thoreau and Emerson uh, were vocal supporters, Thoreau much more so, for engaging in violence against the planter class. So I'm not really, but he could, but I don't know enough about Thoreau's bio. He could very well have been against the Civil War, but he was not against uh, violence perpetrated against uh, the slaveocracy. Yeah, I, th- I think we're going to have to go into Thoreau, but I, I do think they were sympathetic to John Brown at where Hawthorne wasn't, and that being a key uh, key dividing line. He continues, uh, uh, Hawthorne wrote in a kind of snarky, sarcastic way, and I think it's important to read Goodman Brown in that way. I don't think Goodman Brown is really meant like Hawthorne, uh, really meant like Hawthorne stand in for himself, but is instead meant to be more like a cautionary tale. The witches in the forest being compared to in- Indians isn't Hawthorne saying that they're both evil and mystical, but Hawthorne juxtaposes his ancestors' evil in allowing themselves to be overtaken by ridiculous anti-other sentiment and his current society's evil in allowing racist bigotry and a desire for expansion to justify slaughtering uh, the native people. We are not supposed to root for Goodman, but instead see the worst parts of our subconscious in him. I, 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 I think that's gels with what we actually said still that's just my reading and a few points i disagreed with you guys on it is really hard to understand hawthorne's intent because of his writing which is absolutely gorgeous but it was kind of old sounding at his at his time and the direct references he sometimes made to events from his time that have been forgotten Uh, i'd really suggest you guys think about doing another episode and look at some of his other short stories i especially love the christmas banquet uh, Earth's Holocaust. That sounds very interesting. I think that's one about like everyone from a community getting together to like burn material things. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah. Uh, Egotism and the Bosom Serpent. And I think his absolute best story, Rappuccini's Daughter. Thanks again, guys. Uh, keep on reading old books for us. I don't necessarily agree with uh, everything Matteo said there, but I, I want to thank him for that feedback. And I also wanted to say, I didn't go to um, neither of us. Uh, went to grad school for English literature. If you are a listener that knows more about like an uh, author that we write, um, an author that we cover on here, uh, we're not going to be, our egos aren't going to be threatened if you correct us or instruct us on this. Part of this, this isn't really me doing lectures. It's 
me and it's basically us we read a lot and we want to make that a productive activity and so this is a this is an active reading exercise rather than like uh the definitive hawthorne lecture <laughs> um basically um but uh yeah so check us out on youtube uh we're also on all the podcast places i mean you are hearing this right now so presumably you know how to find us this is like playing from like a zeppelin somewhere <laughs> Yeah, unless I, Brooklyn. I'm going to like hack into like Sirius's ra- Sirius Radio's um, mainframe and broadcast it across all channels. Uh, if you're hearing it that way, patreon.com slash literary hangover. Uh, and anyway, here is our conversation on the Maypole of Marymount. Also, I want to say I do come down a bit, uh, sounding a bit hostile to Hawthorne in this one too, which is because... I was upset that he sort of bleached Thomas Morton out of the equation from Marymount. And I think Thomas Morton's really interesting. However, this is still a great story. We st- I still decided to include it in, you know, this, this uh, syllabus of ours. Because I think Hawthorne does have a really good eye for, you know... I mean, a, a maypole... Like, like the chopping down of that maple is a symbolic... Uh, the type of symbolic event that should be, you know, immortalized in literature. So... Well done, Hawthorne. There, I'm not attacking Hawthorne throughout this whole thing. Uh, just <laughs> want to, <laughs> just want to put that out there. But uh, anyway, enjoy the Maypole of Marymount. Welcome to the Literary Hangover. I'm your host, Matt Leck. With me is Alex Guns. Hello, well, welcome, Alex. We're doing our first Nathaniel Hawthorne short story. It's from his Twice Told Tales, The Maypole of Marymount. From Twice Told Tales by Nathaniel Hawthorne. We're going to actually do something a bit experimental. Listeners may know, I'm a big fan of LibriVox. Alex and I both are. Uh, For people who don't know what it is, it's volunteers reading public domain texts for free and uploading it online so you can listen to an audiobook for free. And we have one of the better readers probably the best one I've come across. Yeah, Bob Neufeld has done, uh, done the Maypole on Marymount, and uh, we are, it's actually, it's 26 minutes long, we're going to actually just play the entire, we're going to play through the entire thing, uh, mystery science uh, theater <laughs> style, we're going to be, be that funny, if you want to read it uninterrupted, you should pause this and just read it, because we are going to be stopping, I think, uh, throughout it, just to comment and, and that sort of thing, so it, that might be irritating if you're just trying to experience the narrative. It could be like those DVD commentaries where you listen to this while you're reading <laughs> in some, <laughs> that's even possible. The Maypole of Marymount, from Twice Told Tales by Nathaniel Hawthorne. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Newfeld. There is an admirable foundation for a philosophic romance in the curious history of the early settlement of Mount Wollaston, or Marymount. In the slight sketch here attempted, the facts recorded on the grey pages of our New England analysts have wrought themselves almost spontaneously into a sort of allegory. The masks, mummeries, and festive customs described in the text are in accordance with the manners of the age. Authority on these points may be found in Strutt's Book of English Sports and Pastimes. The history of this isn't terribly well done, actually, and it's not entirely Hawthorne's fault because he didn't have a tremendous amount of really good sources. Thomas Morton, who was sort of the head honcho at Marymount, who we're going to talk about a lot in this, he's sort of the main figure, he didn't actually call it Marymount. It was M-A-R-E Mount, which means like a, a narrow slip of island. And it also, it, to be fair, he was uh, uh, punning a bit. Um, there was like a sort of sea connotations to that. Uh, and he himself made the joke of like the Puritans at one point wanted to come and make it a not merry mount. Yeah, that, <laughs> that was my favorite when they're talking about the uh, Puritans coming in with just a really hard slam with the uh, it's actually not very mount. William Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation uh, was sort of the main text that Hawthorne himself had to work with. And that actually did give it the name merry mount. So the the. Um, uh, the antagonists to Thomas Morton, Hawthorne sort of writ their uh, sort of joke name for it in stone. 
I think one of the things we're going to do more in depth on Hawthorne, but I'm trying to sort of zero in on him is does he avoid sort of more interesting, in my opinion, social and historical and political issues for individualist or or maybe apolitical like things like manners or ways of being um, because this name change from Marymount to the real one which was as I said M-A-R-E Mount the original connotation with the C it's next to it it's on the uh, is that Massachusetts Bay right mm-hmm. it's now Quincy Massachusetts right and it's fascinating to me the actual uh, story behind what happened there. Actually, we should just wait to get into this. We're just going to, I'm going to let the story play a little bit more. Bright were the days at Marymount when the maypole was the banner staff of that gay colony. They who reared it, should their banner be triumphant, were to pour sunshine over New England's rugged hills and scatter flower seed throughout the soil. Jollity and gloom were contending for an empire. Midsummer Eve had come bringing deep verdure to the forest, and roses in her lap of a more vivid hue than the tender buds of spring. But May, or her mirthful spirit, dwelt all the year round at Marymount, sporting with the summer months, and reveling with autumn, and basking in the glow of winter's fireside. Through a world of toil and care she flitted with a dreamlike smile, and came hither to find a home among the lightsome hearts of Marymount. Never had the maypole been so gaily decked as at sunset on Midsummer Eve— this venerated emblem was a pine tree which had preserved the slender grace of youth, while it equaled the loftiest height of the old wood monarchs. From its top streamed a silken banner colored like a rainbow. Down nearly to the ground the pole was dressed with birchen boughs, and others of the liveliest green, and some were silvery leaves, fastened by ribbons that fluttered in fantastic knots of twenty different colors, but no sad ones. Garden flowers and blossoms of the wilderness laughed gladly forth amid the verdure, so fresh and dewy that they must have been grown by magic on that happy pine tree. Were you aware of maypoles growing up? No. Well, we had we had May Day celebrations, which <laughs> this is going to be like so suburban because it's completely without history. But maybe you had it too, where you make a little basket. It's even like a cup of like candy, and then leave it on <laughs> someone's porch and ring the doorbell and run. Uh, I do vaguely. I don't know if I ever participated in that, but I feel like I heard about that. Yeah, I loved it. Like, I thought it was maybe like the holiday right behind Christmas, ringing your friend's doorbell and like giving them candy and like trying to get so they don't catch you. Some of me and my older sister yeah, did. Yeah, did you maybe like put it in your like friend's cubbies at school or something yeah, like that too? Yeah, I think it was integrated like that too, but it, it was kind of like a more nebulous holiday because I don't, there was like, you know, there's no signage at school like there would be for Christmas or Thanksgiving. Right. But the actual t- the maypole itself isn't something you. I, I feel like the first time I even heard of that was like in a Mad Men episode or oh, yeah? something like that. I think it must be an East Coast thing then because, yeah. like, I I had like sort of heard about it and heard there was some sort of political backing to it, but I, this only in doing research for this did I actually like learn what the actual story was. Yeah, I've heard of it as an adult, but yeah, I think you're right that it has to have some sort of like English tradition that would have no... Uh... Indeed, actually, that, that's definitely true. Um, and we have uh, one of the sources, that the, the source I sent Alex here that we mentioned earlier. It's uh, the very hydra of the time, Morton's New English Canaan and uh, Atlantic Trade. Now, you are the literary hangover, you run the literary hangovers theology uh, desk. Department. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you summarize, because I actually, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually foggy on this myself. Puritans, what the fuck was their problem? So, uh, so Puritans, so, oh, uh, all right. I should have prepared you for this, sorry. No, that's okay. It's, 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 it's good to see that I can like condense and explain things that I've read about. So, um, the Reformation in, uh, after 1517, eight technically ignited by Martin Luther, broke out in many different ways and many different quadrants in uh, Europe. For England, like the well-known story is that it was kind of a, it was a way for Henry VIII to seize power. And they kind of considered themselves an independent principality of Christendom going back to like the death of Thomas Becket in uh, the 13th century, or sorry, 12th century. Uh, so when they broke away, there were, are these diff- there were these varying different kinds of movements happening in Europe and they were infiltrating England. And essentially like, you could argue that not a whole lot changed from 
Catholicism to high Angl- Anglicanism, with the exception of like the way that the mass is represented in English instead of uh, Latin. I went to um, uh, what's the old church down in the financial district area? Sure, it's uh, it's one George Washington. Oh, went to. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think it is called Grace Church. Yeah, Karen and I actually went to a mass there, and it was oh, nice. remarkably Catholic. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, from my perspective, so it's. That was their breakaway was essentially staying the same, but that but um, the king or queen of England asserting their authority over that as the head of the church, and that caused you know ruptures. And also, like Ireland didn't switch over and caused all kinds of social and political upheaval for Europe for or sorry for England for like 150 years. But anyways, so this Protestant movement that happened in England, there were texts coming in, particularly by uh, John Calvin who was a French theologian and his idea of like predestination, things like that, a little bit more radical um, were seeping in and not just him, but a number of different kind of Protestant movements, uh, literature was coming in. And so this group called the Puritans are the ones that were like, they would be like the Jacobins of uh, the English Reformation, basically who they were the ones like, no, we need to take this seriously. This Mm -hmm. like, this like we need to have a clean break with uh, the Catholic church, which is, wicked right so they they're really into like at the time like getting rid of any kind of music getting rid of any kind of uh, adornment like very very serious and it's also it's your entire uh lifestyle like mm-hmm. you're li- almost commune-esque living so through from elizabeth the first through james the first and on into like the revolution this was this kind of like group that needed to uh be placated and things like that and it went back and forth on allegiances and how seriously the uh the reigning monarch uh, whether it was elizabeth or james took them and there were like various overtures like king james bible and things like that trying to find ways to like unify the um english kingdom but the puritans were kind of always just like this is they they were looking for a uh, uh, revolution they can't basically. take yes for an answer yeah exactly <laughs> and so that was one of the reasons that they're like well we're out of here basically and so they they were their attempt to like make a uh puritan commune was one of the reasons why they left um and my understanding was their their journey was first to the netherlands and then they're like okay we just got to get the fuck to the united states yeah because at that time the netherlands was like a hotbed for um religious tolerance which was really unheard of especially at that time (laughs) and as we've as we learned from the uh the the daniel walden book or the daniel walden uh, article the maple itself was ancestral from sort of uh, English or British uh, sort of pagan thing. So it's obvious why the Puritans would have an issue with it. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's get back. That was very well done. I am. Thanks. That's the theology. It's off the cuff. Uh, but, we, should, well, we, should, <laughs> we need to have like a, uh, a a jingle for that, like some angels or something. Yeah, just like, or like, just like this, like hint of uh, uh, like even song. Like, uh-huh. yeah, because Alex and I were both raised Catholic, correct? Yeah. Um, but we responded to it very differently. Whereas I, my brain just turns off and thinks like, <laughs> how soon can we get to the parking lot and the car and go watch football at home? Alex loves it. Interesting. Yeah, likes it. <laughs> I think I remember like when I was 10 and uh, talking to our, my uh, priest and him, he like put his hand on my shoulder and he was just like, I can see that you will do great things. And I just remember being like, like of course he knows. <laughs> like, he wouldn't know. And even though I'm, you know, thirty, and like if I probably wouldn't work on me now, it would work on some like reptilian part of my brain, possibly. Right. Interesting. Right. There's Barnaby. The I I don't know what he de- what desk he runs. The uh, arbitrary uh, meowing desk. Back to uh, the Maypole of Marymount. To the wilderness, laughed gladly forth amid the verdure so fresh and dewy that they must have been grown by magic on that happy pine tree. Where this green and flowery splendor terminated, the shaft of the maple was stained with the seven brilliant hues of the banner at its top. On the lowest green bough hung an abundant wreath of roses, some that had been gathered in the sunniest spots of the forest, and others of still richer blush, which the colonists had reared from English seed. O people of the golden age, the chief of your husbandry was to raise flowers. But what was the wild throng that stood hand in hand about the maypole? It could not be that fawns and nymphs, when driven from their classic groves and homes of ancient fable, had sought refuge, as all the persecuted did, in the fresh woods of the West. These were Gothic monsters, though perhaps of Grecian ancestry. On the shoulders of a comely youth uprose the head and branching antlers of a stag. A second, human in all other points, had the grim visage of a wolf. 
A third, still with the trunk and limbs of a mortal man, showed the beard and horns of a venerable a pagan stuff here. There was the likeness of a bear erect, brute in all but his hind legs, which were adorned with pink silk stockings. And here again, almost as wondrous, stood a real bear of the dark forest, lending each of his forepaws to the grasp of a human hand, and as ready for the dance as any in that circle. His inferior nature rose halfway to meet his companions as they stooped. Other faces wore the similitude of man or woman, but distorted or extravagant, with red noses pendulous before their mouths, which seemed of awful depth and stretched from ear to ear in an eternal fit of laughter. Here might be seen the savage man, well known in heraldry, hairy as a baboon and girdled with green leaves. By his side, a nobler figure, but still a count of it, appeared an Indian hunter with feathery crest and wampum belt. Many of this strange company wore a fool's caps, and had little bells appended to their garments, tinkling with a silvery sound responsive to the inaudible music of their gleesome spirits. So it mentions uh, uh, some people dressed up as Native Americans there. Um, it says, By his side a, nob a nobler figure, but still counterfeit, appeared an Indian hunter with feathery crest and wampum belt. Now, as we learn from that, the, uh, the article uh, by Walden, it wasn't just people dressed up as Indian hunters. Marymount was distinguished itself from Plymouth in a number of ways. Uh, one, it wasn't a, a, a ethno state, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, as we'll see in Hope Leslie, which we're yet to record, um, there's not racial mixing in that society. It's not. It's frowned upon. Whereas. One of the advantages we for uh, for Marymount is that there's a lot of economic advantages because it's a fun place. If you're a sailor, uh, it's, let's say you're like you just dropped some slaves off in the Caribbean, or and then you have to get some turpentine up in the up in the uh, eastern seaboard to like maintain the ship. It's like that sort of thing. Like you're going to stop at the fun place. You're not going to stop at Plymouth and you know have a boring time and also mentions that thomas morton um well i don't know let's talk about thomas morton a little bit had you heard of him at no, all not at all actually yeah it's pretty he's a pretty interesting figure yeah especially in that article that you're talking about i, I pulled out a quote that i thought was interesting where it said quote fur traders along the uh new england coast had already learned that the natives expected a certain amount of entertainment to accompany business transactions European traders in the American Atlantic, rec oh yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, looking at it through like a materialist lens of like this outfit is ma is killing it right now, possibly like with Native American trade, which is the ostensible reason why they're there is trade. The Puritans is like, uh, they have no interest in meshing or trying to find a good way to like get along. They're trying to recreate a perfect utopian society. Basically. Yeah, and, and this article also suggests that the uh, Plymouth Puritans had read about Jamestown mm -hmm. and how sailors, uh, influx of sailors at certain times had just fucked their economy entirely. Yeah. Because you think, like, and you would see, like, these are small economies. Mm -hmm. So a big influx of, you know, spending money. And they make a note that sailors they're not fucking like investing in the local community. They're yeah. getting wasted and like having sex with prostitutes yeah. or like Indian women. We'll just use the vernacular of the time uh, that they're trading with. And it's interesting. The the part where they talk about how um, um, what Weldon talks about, there's a temptation and probably a right one in many cases to, consider that in terms of uh, ethnosexual domination so white men you know dominating you know indian women but uh there's also that was also a, a sort of cultural thing as the quote you mentioned earlier that entertainment meant i mean it meant maples and like dressing up like shit but it also meant like having sex uh, yeah interracially uh, quote, uh, the extension of May Day revels uh, beyond the 1st of May not only attracted the sailors and ships that drove the Atlantic trade network, but facilitated the trade itself, creating the economic situation that so concerned Bradford. While the separatists and Puritans, are, are those two separate groups? Yeah, and I, that, that'll have to be enough for our theology corner, because okay. I don't remember who, what theology the difference is. Theology just closed, yeah. Uh, maintained a deliberate and strict trade environment, 
Uh, trade at Marymount was freer and less prescribed. For one thing, the revelous social environment that attracted sailors was itself beneficial to trade with Native Americans all along the Atlantic, co- Atlantic coast. By the late 16th century, uh, Heath demonstrates fur traders along. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a quote you uh, you actually uh, uh, mentioned. And you know, we should say I have it here uh, later on. It wasn't just you know um, just for the amorous eroticism of it all um as uh as a north dakotan when we had the um oil uh boom Mm -hmm. there was news stories about how uh strippers were flying from las vegas to north dakota to make a lot of of um money at the strip clubs right oh yeah these frontier environments are often the similar to the oil patches where it's a lot of men there and so if you can just if you can just find some women are there uh that is a huge advantage i'll, I'll read from this here um, um in the new english canon which we might actually have to read that sounds like yeah an when you get, when you was citing and then i looked it up on wikipedia after i was like mm, that's something i should probably be reading soon at, at hawthorne's time uh john quincy adams had a copy and brevort who was uh, one of the guys who hooked up uh irving um, oh. and that curve in the Broadway that we talked about. Um, he oh, yeah. had another copy, but those are the only two guys. Hawthorne himself wouldn't have read it. Um, uh, but Morton, Thomas Morton, the guy who did Marymount, um, he wrote New English Canon when he was in exile in the UK. Um, the Puritans sent him on boats a couple times uh, back home because he was, uh, as we'll find out, a, a disruptive figure. Uh, in New English Canon, Morton refers to these interracial sexual relationships as harmless mirth made by young men that lived in hope to have wives brought brought over to them. And it was this mirth that was much distasted of the precise separatists. Uh, it's funny the the adjectives he it's uses. It's stuff like that that just is like, it's like that lady doth protest too much. It was like, it's harmless revelry. When just like, you can just like, okay, what the hell was going on there? Yeah. Which is like something insane, possibly. Ostensibly, Morton confirms the moral issue at the heart of Bradford's problem with Marymount. Uh, but the economic function of these relationships is not far from Morton's mind. After commenting on the young men making harmless mirth, Morton <laughs> adds a parenthetical aside that links their sexual activities to fiscal realities, saying that sex with Indian women, quote, would save them a labor to make a voyage to fetch any over. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Morton's willingness to engage in these sexual practices is by no means unique, but the degree to which he seems to have understood the financial opportunity for exploiting the cultural practices of Native Americans and Atlantic sailors is impressive. Morton's use of sex as a bartering tool with the sailors, who would have no incentive to establish long-term trade relations with Indian groups near Marymount, could easily have been manipulated to increase his own profits. In this way, Morton could have acted as an intermediary between local indigenous populations and the sailors, essentially using sex as a commodity that he could offer the transient low-level maritime traders. But you know what? Um, Hmm. That... I I I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to condemn him too much earlier because he does have some interesting leveling uh, dynamics. But perhaps we should let's let's listen yeah. to a bit of the story. The company wore fool's caps and had little bells appended to their garments, tinkling with a silvery sound responsive to the inaudible music of their gleesome spirits. Some youths and maidens were of a soberer garb, yet well maintained their places in the irregular throng by the expression of wild revelry upon their features. Such were the colonists of Marymount, as they stood in the broad smile of sunset round their venerated maypole. Had a wanderer, bewildered in the melancholy forest, heard their mirth, and stolen a half-affrighted glance, he might have fancied them the crew of Comus, some already transformed to brutes, some midway between man and beast, and the others rioting in their flow of tipsy jollity that foreran the change. But a band of Puritans, who watched the scene, invisible themselves, compared the masks to those devils and ruined souls with whom their superstition peopled the black wilderness. I just want to stop briefly wilderness. to maybe note that there might be some sort of voyeur, like voyeuristic signaling that Hawthorne's doing, like the Puritans are in the dark watching this, these Maypole shenanigans, right? Yeah. It's sort of like the reader, almost. That's interesting. Well, yeah, maybe when we get to the actual section, I feel like they're like, ah, we'll, we'll get to it. Uh, but well, the well, I liked when he called them. Is it the crew of Comus? Is that what he said? Yeah, I I that I don't know that reference. That's that. uh, from Greek mythology. That's Bacchus's uh, son. So he's a Greek god of 
of like partying, but also of like anarchy. Uh. And then I also was just like reading. I remember that John Milton, the poet, had written a, a mask, which is like a page or like a a court pageant uh, to Comus. There is actually a, I didn't I didn't send it to you, but there's an article looking at uh, Penseroso and Allegro by Milton. You know, oh, Penseroso and Allegro. Yeah, that that was um, a model for the this actual short story. That's interesting. So I was wondering. I feel like there was a, one or two allusions to Milton in this. That I couldn't. I wasn't totally sure. You, I think uh, the the academics would say you were. Turns out I'm well a observed. fucking genius. <laughs> <laughs> the scene invisible themselves, compared the masks to those devils and ruined souls with whom their superstition peopled the black wilderness. Within the ring of monsters appeared the two airiest forms that had ever trodden on any more solid footing than a purple and golden cloud. One was a youth in glistening apparel, with a scarf of the rainbow pattern crosswise on his breast. His right hand held a gilded staff, the ensign of high dignity among the revellers, and his left grasped the slender fingers of a fair maiden not less gaily decorated than himself. Bright roses glowed in contrast with the dark and glossy curls of each, and were scattered round their feet, or had sprung up spontaneously there. Behind this lightsome couple, so close to the maypole that its boughs shaded his jovial face, stood the figure of an English priest, canonically dressed, yet decked with flowers, in heathen fashion, and wearing a chaplet of the native vine-leaves. By the riot of his rolling eye and the pagan decorations of his holy garb, he seemed the wildest monster there, and the very commus of the crew. "'Votaries of the maypole!' cried the flower-decked priest. "'Merrily all day long have the woods echoed to your mirth. But be this your merriest hour, my hearts. Lo, here stand the lord and lady of the may, whom I, a clerk of Oxford and high priest of Merrymount, am presently to join in holy matrimony.' Up with your nimble spirits, ye morris dancers, green men and glee maidens, bears and wolves and horned gentlemen. Come, a chorus now, rich with the old mirth of merry England, and the wilder glee of this fresh forest, and then a dance, to show the youthful pair what life is made of, and how airily they should go through it. All ye that love the maypole, lend your voices to the nuptial song of the Lord and Lady of the May. This wedlock was more serious than most affairs at Merrimount, where jest and delusion, trick and fantasy, kept up a continual carnival. The Lord and Lady of the May, though their titles must be laid down at sunset, were really and truly to be partners for the dance of life, beginning the measure that same it's bright eve. It's weird to me that uh, Hawthorne's attitude towards marriage, right, we see it is central to, um, or, or maybe just interpersonal romantic relationships, central to Scarlet Letter. Mm-hmm. That wedlock is the most serious time in Marymount is, and that it looks remarkably similar, except for maybe how public it is, to what marriage would look like in Plymouth. This is just monogamy again. Yeah, I guess I was reading it. It's like, you know, when he was describing, like, they actually are getting married. I felt like he was, like, signaling to the reader that, yeah, I know they're, like, culturally appropriating and, like, putting on this party or a joke but like this one serious thing is happening at this like otherwise ridiculous uh party was my reading of that okay yeah though their titles must be laid down at sunset were really and truly to be partners for the dance of life beginning the measure that same bright eve the wreath of roses that hung from the lowest green bough of the maypole had been twined for them and would be thrown over both their heads in symbol of their flowery union when the priest had spoken therefore a riotous uproar burst from the rout of monstrous figures. "'Bring you the stave, reverend sir,' cried they all, "'and never did the woods ring to such a merry peal as we of the maypole shall send up.' Immediately a prelude of pipe, cittern, and vial, touched with practised minstrelsy, began to play from a neighbouring thicket in such a mirthful cadence that the boughs of the maypole quivered to the sound. But the May Lord, he of the gilded staff, chancing to look into his lady's eyes, was wonderstruck at the almost pensive glance that met his own. "'Edith, sweet lady of the May,' whispered he reproachfully, "'is yon wreath of roses a garland to hang above our graves that you look so sad? Oh, Edith, this is our golden time. Tarnish it not by any pensive shadow of the mind, for it may be that nothing of futurity will be brighter than the mere remembrance of what is now passing.' "'That was the very thought that saddened me. How came it into your mind, too?' said Edith, in a still lower tone than he, for it was high treason to be sad at Merrymount. Therefore do I sigh amid this festive music. And besides, dear Edgar, 
I struggle as with a dream, and fancy that these shapes of our jovial friends are visionary, and their mirth unreal, and that we are no true lord and lady of the May. What is the mystery in my heart? Just then. I, I really like that moment. I like, it seemed very human. I, I feel like I can relate to that. There's something tyrannical about a really great social moment in your life when you know it's going to end really soon. Mm. And it's like, this is like probably as happy as I'm ever going to be. And it's going to be over like extremely soon. I know, I, I, I feel like I know that feeling and it's cool to see that in a story that's so remote from my own experience. I think of both graduations. Mm, that's interesting. Um, you know, the first graduation after high school, the whole like going around to everyone. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to this school for this major, I hope to do this, blah, 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 blah good luck sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that was college, and that's fine. And then, you know, as N- I graduated from NYU in 2014 um, for the master's degree in radio, city music hall, and then being unemployed, more or less, off and on some things, but like unemployed generally for like a year after that. Mm-hmm. And I kind of knew that was a possibility. So it was like, you're at this height and then you're like, fuck, like what? I don't have anything lined up. Yeah. I feel like there's like an inherent melancholy with any kind of major, um, like the known major moments of your life, because it just reminds you that once you've passed, you're like, oh yeah, like I'm supposed to pass. It's like, I'm supposed to get married or I'm supposed to graduate. And that's just one more reminder that like you did it and other people did it and you're going to die (laughs) and you're just going to pass on and you can't even really hold on to anything. It just slips right past you. And I can see when she, when, when he's like, this is going to be the happiest, you know, this is the happiest we'll ever be. And she's like, I know that's why I'm so sad. I was like, yeah, yeah, me too. (laughs) The one thing I will quibble with is it it was against the law to be sad in Marymount. Right, yeah. It, that's high treason. That seems like some Dr. Seuss shit. Like we're in Whoville or <laughs> yeah. something. Like Yeah. I think that's the that's the main critique I have and and I like uh I like Hawthorne's writing. I don't know if I necessarily like this but I won't get ahead of myself, but that's the main criticism is when he collapses things like that into like yeah. Like this is there's genuinely an interesting social dynamic going on with this town, you know. We mentioned the um, earlier that there was someone dressed up like a a hunting Indian. I can't remember exactly what Hawthorne said, but one of the things that really, besides the interracial uh, sex parties, <laughs> um, one of the things that really upset the Puritans with Morton was. Uh, Morton was selling guns to Native Americans. Sorry to bring identity politics into this. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry to be an SJW, but the Puritans were like, those Indians are doing identity politics, so don't sell them any guns. Yeah. Uh, it's weird. That's a direct quote. Yeah, exactly. Stop the identity politics. We, we, I'm not playing that game. You're forcing us to do identity <laughs> politics. Yeah. Every time I see a Native American with a gun, it just makes me want to genocide them more. Yeah, so it's thank these, you. Oh, the minorities that just do identity politics that force the white people who never do identity politics ever. Mm-hmm. It's funny. So this uh, this guns and Indians thing, it was actually outlawed by James the first, but it was in sort of like a executive order type of way. Yeah. Whereas that's uh, not fucking legally binding. Um, it's interesting. Like it, these things probably come apart in similar ways. Right, so like you have decrees, like that don't sell guns to Indians over there, and it's like, well, one, you didn't go through like whatever legislative body we have at this point in time, and two, at this point you're dead. So I'm going to read for, again from this uh, Walden. Bradford's largest and most cited complaint about Morton that he was that he traded guns to the Indians. In the section immediately preceding his discussion of Mary Mount. Uh, in of Plymouth Plantation, Bradford does mention that Dutch, French, and even English fishermen had been trading guns with the Indians to the northeast for some time, and those guns were slowly making their way into Plymouth's vicinity. But because of the distances these weapons traveled from their original point of trade, this commerce had minimal effect on Plymouth's economy. Um, and, I mean, probably their like sense of like when to duck. Yeah. Um, at Marymount, thanks to its proximity to 
Plymouth, the situation was much different. Bradford's chief legal, chief legal complaint against Morton was his refusal to abide by James I's earlier proclamation restricting English Indian trade in firearms. Bradford's record of Morton's response that the king's proclamation was no law and that the king was dead and his displeasure with him uh, ultimately convinced Bradford that they must resort to force in dealing with Morton. But Morton's response, according to Thomas Cartelli and Richard Drennan, is technically correct. There was no English law uh, against selling guns. King James's proclamation in 1622 against the practice did not have the status of law. And besides, a royal proclamation held force only during the lifetime of, his procl- of its proclaimer. Despite the verbal allegiances to King James, Bradford's motivation in chastising Morton was economic, not legal. Bradford's two complaint that the trade environment at Marymount created an economic system that Plymouth could never sustain sounds remarkably similar to John Smith's uh, description of the sailor's effect of trade at Jamestown. Let's get back to the story. And that we are no true lord and lady of the May. What is the mystery in my heart? Just then, as if a spell had loosened them, down came a little shower of withering rose leaves from the maypole. Alas for the young lovers! No sooner had their hearts glowed with real passion than they were sensible of something vague and unsubstantial in their former pleasures, and felt a dreary presentiment of inevitable change. From the moment that they truly loved, they had subjected themselves to earth's doom of care and sorrow and troubled joy, and had no more a home at Merrymount. That was Edith's mystery. Now leave we the priests to marry them, and the maskers to sport round the maypole till the last sunbeam be withdrawn from its summit, and the shadows of the forest mingle gloomily in the dance. Meanwhile, we may discover who these gay people were. Two hundred years ago, and more, the old world and its inhabitants became mutually weary of each other. Men voyaged by thousands to the west, some to barter glass and such like jewels for the furs of the Indian hunter, some to conquer virgin empires, and one stern band to pray. Decent but summer. none of these motives had much weight with a striving to communicate their... I love that line, or that d- the description is really telling the old world became tired of that people from the old world got tired with uh, the place. Wait, what is the line? Let's go back. I can. I have it written. Actually, I have it right here. If I can just pull it up. Uh, it's like the. Now leave we the priests to marry them, and the maskers to sport round the maypole till the last sunbeam be withdrawn from its summit, and the shadows of yeah, the forest right. mingle gloomily in the dance. Meanwhile, we may discover who these gay people were. Two hundred years ago and more, the old world and its inhabitants became mutually weary. Yeah, I love each other. that because it. It's telling for later on. It wasn't any, like, kind of social upheaval that caused these people to leave. It wasn't any kind of, like, mm. groups of people getting along. It was just this, like, mutual agreeance with the people in the land, I guess, that mm. were like, the, we're out of here. And that, yeah. to me, that, comes, that theme comes into play in the final act of this. Okay, interesting. Oh, and more, the old world and its inhabitants became mutually weary of each other. Men voyaged by thousands to the west, some to barter glass and such like jewels for the furs of the Indian hunter, some to conquer virgin empires, and one stern band to pray. But none of these motives had much weight with a striving to communicate their mirth to the grave Indian, or masquerading in the skins of deer and wolves which they had hunted for that especial purpose. Often the whole colony were playing at blind man's bluff, magistrates and all with their eyes bandaged, except a single scapegoat, whom the blinded sinners pursued by the tinkling of the bells at his garments. Once, it is said, they were seen following a flower-decked corpse with merriment and festive music to his grave. But did the dead man laugh? Yeah. Completely fell flat. (laughs) Yeah. Times they sang ballads and told tales for the edification of their pious visitors, or perplexed them with juggling tricks, or grinned at them through horse collars. And when sport itself grew wearisome, They made game of their own stupidity and began a yawning match. Oh, wait, yeah. Can we pause that for a second? That reminds me of um, reading Rip Van Winkle and with the importance of, like, people coming to the new world that are allowed to be stupid and allowed to be lazy. Mm. Rip Van Winkle is this, like, hero because he doesn't give a shit and he's, like, bad at his job. It's the same thing here where it's, like, Finally, people can have like, yawning contests. Yeah, Hawthorne has like some kind of like uh, ironic detachment from it, being like, "How ridiculous is that?" But I think he still kind of lauds that kind of lifestyle of the, just the lazy, non-ascendant 
human. Do you think that's the sort of surface level reading of this? That Hawthorne is sympathetic to the Murthy, the the Maypolers? I think, yeah. I think he seems to th- he seems to think that uh, we'll get to it at the end. Okay. I don't know, or maybe I'm just like teasing it too much, but I don't want to spoil it. Yeah, Rapidity, no. and began a yawning match. At the very least of these enormities, the men of iron shook their heads and frowned so darkly that the revellers looked up, imagining that a momentary cloud had overcast the sunshine which was to be perpetual there. On the other hand, the Puritans affirmed that when a psalm was pealing from their place of worship, the echo which the forest sent them back seemed often like the chorus of a jolly catch, closing with a roar of laughter. Who but the fiend and his bond-slaves, the crew of Merrymount, had thus disturbed them? In due time a feud arose, stern and bitter on one side, and as serious on the other as anything could be among such light spirits as had sworn allegiance to the Maypole. The future complexion of New England was involved in this important quarrel. Should the grisly saints establish their jurisdiction over the gay sinners, then would their spirits darken all the clime, and make it a land of clouded visages, of hard toil, of sermon and psalm for ever. But should the banner staff of Merrymount be fortunate, sunshine would break upon the hills, and flowers would beautify the forest, and late posterity do homage to the Maypole. After these authentic passages from history, we return to the nuptials of the Lord and Lady of the May. <laughs> Alas, we have delayed too long, and must darken our tale too suddenly. As we glance again at the Maypole, a solitary sunbeam is fading from the summit, and leaves only a faint golden tinge blended with the hues of the rainbow banner. Even that dim light is now withdrawn, relinquishing the whole domain of Merry Mounts to the evening gloom, which has rushed so instantaneously from the black surrounding woods. But some of these black shadows have rushed forth in human shape. Yes, with the setting sun, the last day of mirth had passed from Merry Mount. The ring of gay maskers was disordered and broken, the stag lowered his antlers in dismay, the wolf grew weaker than a lamb, the bells of the Morris dancers tinkled with tremulous affright. The Puritans had played a characteristic part in the Maypole mummeries. Their darksome figures were intermixed with the wild shapes of their foes, and made the scene a picture of the moments when... I imagine the Puritans coming in like, um, like basically cops. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like Stop cops resisting. The time. Yeah, exactly. And the Maypolers in, like, costumes and stuff, like, I don't know, like, making fart noise or something. This were intermixed with the wild shapes of their foes, and made the scene a picture of the moments when waking thoughts start up amid the scattered fantasies of a dream. The leader of the hostile party stood in the center of the circle, while the rout of monsters cowered around him like evil spirits in the presence of a dread magician. No fantastic foolery could look him in the face. So stern was the energy of his aspect that the whole man, visage, frame, and soul, seemed wrought of iron, gifted with life and thought, yet all of one substance with its headpiece and breastplate. It was the Puritan of Puritans. It was Endicott himself. "'Stand off, priest of Baal!' said he, with a grim frown, and laying no reverent hand upon the surplice. I know thee, Blackstone, thou art the man who couldst not abide the rule even of thine own corrupted church, and hast come hither to preach iniquity, and to give example of it in thy life. But now shall it be seen that the Lord hath sanctified this wilderness for his peculiar people. Woe unto them that would defile it, and first for this flower-decked abomination, the altar of thy worship. And with his keen sword Endicott assaulted the hallowed maypole. Nor long did it resist his arm. It groaned with a dismal sound. It showered leaves and rosebuds upon the remorseless enthusiast, and finally, with all its green boughs and ribbons and flowers, symbolic of departed pleasures, down fell the banner staff of Merrymount. As it sank, tradition says, the evening sky grew darker, and the woods threw forth a more sombre shadow. There! cried Endicott, looking triumphantly on his work. There lies the only maypole in New England. The thought is strong within me that by its fall is shadowed forth the fate of lights and idle mirth-makers amongst us and our posterity. Amen, saith John Endicott. Amen, echoed his followers. But the votaries of the Maypole gave one groan for their idol. At the sound the Puritan leader glanced at the crew of Comus, each a figure of broad mirth, yet at this moment strangely expressive of sorrow and dismay. "'Valiant captain,' quoth Peter Palfrey, the ancient of the band, what order shall be taken with the prisoners? I thought not to repent me of cutting down a maypole, replied Endicott. Yet now I could find it in my heart to plant it again, and give each of these bestial pagans one other dance round their idol. It would have served rarely for a whipping post. But there are pine trees enough, suggested the lieutenant. Now isn't that kind of revealing? So he chops the thing down. And he's like, God, I should have I waited. 
This is that thing where it's like you can have one marshmallow now <laughs> or you can right. have two later. Yeah, the, Im- like, the immediate pleasure of destroying their merriment. It's like, fuck that thing. going to yeah. knock that shit Could have been used for torture. But then it's like, I could have done that with style points. Like I could have yeah. tied up these people and just lashed the fuck out of them. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. And, and I think that's actually Hawthorne. Hawthorne loves those sort of empty signifiers right like that is the scarlet letter Mm -hmm. it can mean it can mean one thing um to a certain society and then by force of basically individual courage or will or power uh, it is now means something else it now means like a dope place to tie people up to whip them yeah as opposed to something that you know people dance around yeah yeah the the maypole i think probably speaks volumes about how the viewer sees it much more than like it existing in any plane it's just this metamorphous being that uh changes with whoever is receiving it also it's a i, I should have said floating signifier i think that is a technical uh, semiotics term I, I don't want anyone to get on me for other that. dance round their idol it would have served rarely for a whipping post but there are pine trees enough suggested the lieutenant true good ancient said the leader Wherefore, bind the heathen crew, and bestow on them a small matter of stripes apiece, as earnest of our future justice. Set some of the rogues in the stocks to rest themselves, so soon as providence shall bring us to one of our own well-ordered settlements, where such accommodations may be found. Further penalties, such as branding or cropping of ears, shall be thought of hereafter. "'How many stripes for the priest?' inquired ancient Palfrey. "'None as yet,' answered Endicott, bending his iron frown upon the culprit. It must be for the great and general court to determine whether stripes or long imprisonment and other grievous penalty may atone for his transgressions. Let him look to himself, for such as violate our civil order, it may be permitted us to show mercy. But woe to the wretch that troubleth our religion! And this dancing bear, resumed the officer, must he share the stripes of his fellows? Shoot him through the head, (laughs) said the energetic Puritan. (laughs) Now that is a hell of a couple of paragraphs. Well, it's just like, they're stringent uh worldview turns into like bloodlust so quickly which is you know uh very relatable in 2018 Sh- shoot that fucking bear right through the head yeah come like, on yeah they're Just gonna give him a chance it. to follow the new rules it's not supposed to be dancing it's not supposed yeah. to know how to dance it's an animal i don't know how that bear can dance it's standing on hind legs it's it's getting ideas above its station um Hawthorne is basically in agreement as far as I can tell. And, you know, we don't want to make the intentional fallacy, as the new critics would call it, um, that the author agrees with what's being said in this story. But it seems like the way this is presented that that priest was really, f- like, fucking up in Hawthorne's eyes by, like, doing these sorts of activities. I, I read it that there was no there was like no way to challenge the Puritans anyways. Mm. I thought it was interesting that they're the way they make themselves present is they're like co identified with whoops co identified with uh, nature. Mm. That they're a force of nature, that they actually change the weather when they show up. Yeah, that's a good point. And it, it's almost like an escape valve for Hawthorne to be like, listen, I, I'm not going to say either way with these Puritans. It's just something that happens. Which is similar, I think, basically, especially in terms of settler colonialism, uh, generally, and uh, basically in European colonists taking over land. Mm-hmm. It, it, Sedgwick and Hope Leslie is like that. Like That is the dominant mode. Uh, I think definitely also... Um, uh, even even maybe most prominently James Fenimore Cooper. Um, anyway, yeah, let's let's continue. We got a little bit left here. And this dancing bear, resumed the officer, must he share the stripes of his fellows? Shoot him through the head, said the energetic skeleton. I suspect witchcraft in the beast. Here be a couple of shining ones, continued Peter Palfrey, pointing his weapon at the Lord and Lady of the May. They seem to be of high station among these misdoors. Methinks their dignity will not be fitted with less than a double share of stripes. Endicott rested on his sword and closely surveyed the dress and aspect of the hapless pair. There they stood. Wait, can we pause that for a second? Yeah. Okay, double share of stripes. What Does that mean prison? Does that mean being no, shot? No, stripes is a whip. Okay, so that's what... For when I when I first read that, I couldn't tell, but it seemed like an allusion to... Uh, this is Theology Corner again. With uh, Job, when he gets everything taken away from him as like a test by God and fails a test, but... Cause he, 
questions God's judgment. But at the end of the story, he gets twice as much of everything that he lost. Like it's like twice as many kids. Nice. I can't help but there feel like there's like some in that's like that would be the Puritan inversion of that story, which is you don't get twice as much grain, you get twice as many whips, basically. <laughs> Lord and closely surveyed the dress and aspect of the hapless pair. There they stood, pale, downcast, and apprehensive, yet there was an air of mutual support and a pure affection, seeking aid and giving it, that showed them to be man and wife with the sanction of a priest upon their love. The youth, in the peril of the moment, had dropped his gilded staff and thrown his arm about the Lady of the May, who leaned against his breast too lightly to burden him, but with weight enough to express that their destinies were linked together for good or evil. They looked first at each other, and then into the grim captain's face. There they stood in the first hour of wedlock, while the idle pleasures of which their companions were the emblems had given place to the sternest cares of life, personified by the dark Puritans. But never had their youthful beauty seemed so pure and high as when its glow was chastened by adversity. "'Youth,' said Endicott, "'ye stand in an evil case, thou and thy maiden wife. Make ready presently, for I am minded that you shall both have a token to remember your wedding day.' "'Stern man,' cried the Maylord, "'how can I move thee?' May Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Stern man, cried the May Lord, how can I move thee? Were the means at hand, I would resist to the death. Being powerless, I entreat. Do with me as you wilt, but let Edith go untouched. Not so, replied the immitigable zealot. We are not wont to show an idle courtesy to that sex which requireth the stricter discipline. What sayest thou, maid? Shall thy silken bridegroom suffer thy share of the penalty besides his own? Be it death said Edith, and lay it all on me. Truly, as Indicott had said, the poor lovers stood in a woeful case. Their foes were triumphant, their friends captive and abased, their home desolate, the benighted wilderness around them, and a rigorous destiny in the shape of the Puritan leader, their only guide. Yet the deepening twilight could not altogether conceal that the Iron Man was softened. He smiled at the fair spectacle of early love. He almost sighed for the inevitable blight of early hopes. "'The troubles of life have come hastily on this young couple,' observed Endicott. We will see how they comport themselves under their present trials, ere we burden them with greater. If among the spoil there be any garments of a more decent fashion, let them yeah. be put upon this maylord and his lady, instead of their glistening vanities. Well, that to me, that's that's like the crux of the whole story, yeah. is that, that he pauses and he can see him, some younger version of himself in them. And that frames the whole story of, like, of, it talks about progress in this really dark and foreboding way. That's like, it's inescapable in the way that I feel like even now we talk about progress in a much different way, which is like things are, you know, uh, we revert to like, things are, uh, going to get better and keep getting better for like material needs and social needs and things right. like that. Whereas I feel like the point of view of this story is that Puritanism is inevitable, both in like a community and individually. It's getting real. Yeah. It's like growing up and, having some sort of like detachment to the world. And so even the leader of this Puritan movement, he can, he remembers being like a May day, uh, uh, husband or whatever. And like, he remembers that time in his life. And like, the, the, so, so, so interesting before the Puritans even show up that, that, that couple has that foreboding that they know they're going to be Puritans someday mm. or some version of it someday, even before they're even there. And then when they're faced or at least with it, that their way of life is not long for this world. Like, yeah, yeah. And Hawthorne conflates the two. It's that there is no culture clash. It's only individuals going up against each other and like and they're all going to become some version of Puritans and it's not it's there's there's no interest in saying like, you know, what's the difference with these two cultures basically. Right. Among the spoil there be any garments of a more decent fashion, let them be put upon this maylord and his lady instead of their glistening vanities. Look to it, some of you. "'And shall not the youth's hair be cut?' asked Peter Palfrey, looking with abhorrence at the lovelock and long glossy curls of the young man. "'Crop it forthwith, and that in the true pumpkin-shell fashion,' answered the captain. "'Then bring them along with us, but more gently than their fellows. There be qualities in the youth which may make him valiant to fight, and sober to toil, and pious to pray, and in the maiden that may fit her to become a mother in our Israel, bringing up babes in better nurture than her own hath been.' Nor think ye, young ones, that they are the happiest, even in our lifetime of a moment, who misspend it in dancing round a maypole. And Endicott, the <laughs> severest Puritan of all, who laid the rock foundation of New England, lifted the wreath of roses from the ruin of the maypole, and threw it with his own gauntleted hand over the heads of the Lord and Lady of the May. It was a deed of prophecy. 
As the moral gloom of the world overpowers all systematic gaiety, even so was their home of wild mirth made desolate amid the sad forest. They returned to it no more. But as their flowery garland was wreathed of the brightest roses that had grown there, so in the tie that united them were intertwined all the purest and best of their early joys. They went heavenward, supporting each other along the difficult path which it was their lot to tread, and never wasted one regretful thought on the vanities of Marymount. The vanities of Marymount. Yeah, I guess if there is any kind of criticism, it might actually be in those like last couple of lines, or like when Hawthorne shows his hand a little bit for what who he's rooting for. The issue is, Thomas Morton is basically the original globalist of America, and the Puritans being the white nationalists, or the Christians, the, the original identity politic, the Christian man. And it it's an interesting story because, you know, when I first saw this, I a lot of Hawthorne's stories on the surface look really righteous and maybe not radical but like progressive right yeah um and i uh, the first time through this story i thought the the i th- i thought like oh yeah that another one of these examples of um you know scarlet letters about like let's not you know shame women for sex um uh seven gables is about inherited power and privilege and and the decay of it and this is about, you know, like uh, puritanistic things. But but uh, you can always find like these sort of very conservative through lines if you look closer than that. Yeah. I think it seems like for Hawthorne, both in Scarlet Letter and this, symbols signify essentially nothing. But only are there to like cover these like natural movements uh, in every human life that can't you can't escape it. It's almost like he's having it both ways. Like he can celebrate the merriment of the maypole saying like, it's doomed to fail. And that's like why it's beautiful, but also saying, and good that it's destroyed at the end because that's the natural way of things. Yeah. And they never regretted it. Yeah. And the, the closest way I can map this story onto modern life is actually one of my more conservative opinions, which is, uh, I think, or liberal, I guess you could call it. Um, Tradi- classically liberal classical liberal opinions which is you know I think comedy is actually a sort of safe space for conceptual play uh, I, I think it can be criticized but I do not think that you can prescribe what topics can and cannot be joked about that's not the language that the people actually that, that actually do comedy speak it, that is prompted by this story because it has really simplified history <laughs> Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, the the real thing isn't that the downers were, like, crushing the, the people who like to, have, like, tell jokes. Uh, <laughs> um, the real thing is that, um, is economic. It's, it's racial and sort of cultural. This may not have been intentional. But the effect is, I think, pretty negative. Just the simple act of naming this Marymount, M-E-R-R-Y, uh, M O U N T, and not the the real mm-hmm. what they actually considered it. It makes it seem more frivolous, and I think that's what this story does too. And that's my main critique with it because I actually think like, had I not uh, was were I not doing this podcast through this lens, I would may have I may I may have read that story and thought that was maybe like somewhat similar to what history the history of that was. Um, come to find that it's actually occluding uh, a much more interesting history of one of the more radical figures in American history, like a guy who's selling guns to Native Americans, who's le- like basically, I mean, if you want to put it the most crass way, he's, a, he's, he's like facilitating sex trade um, between sailors and Native Americans. But like from the perspective of like, are we just going to be, uh, um, a separatist or a apartheid that slowly takes over the country or are we going to like mix with people like you know that's the the that's preferable i think um i also wanted to mention or do you have anything to say on- yeah i i kind of i totally agree with you i think that there's i think hawthorne in this story sees like a natural harmony in the conqueror and the conquered in a way that removes any kind of like moral impetus for the conqueror and just like makes it an inevitable uh fact of nature that the Puritans are going to come in and they're going to win because that's how the game was set. And that kind of like, 
ignores any kind of responsibility of anyone to like to rise up Mm -hmm. (laughs) because you're you're always meant to be dominated by that more powerful force it seems like you can be indulged and your and your punishment will be lessened by a kind authority but you'll be under that authority yeah and that's how it should be basically right and actually that that is um uh this this weldon piece talks about how the puritans did have room for dissent because they thought it was a way like obviously they were dissenters right Mm -hmm. Uh, but i want to read a bit more about morton as a leveler Uh, this is from the uh, the weldon piece Uh, on a significant level the threat of new hybrid hybridized population uh, the result of european american conjugation uh, combined with the extent Extant free association of social classes at Marymount compounded the seriousness of the problem for Bradford. Central to Morton's socioeconomic design for his plantation was the maintenance of the revelrous atmosphere that stimulated trade. As much as Morton, who was most likely a newly classed member of the English gentry, may have wanted to establish himself as a New World aristocrat, leisurely ruling from his country manor, uh, enjoying the fruits of underprivileged la- of the underprivileged laboring around him, he understood that the social and cultural infrastructure to support such a hierarchy did not exist in America. To simulate the power that would lie in his hands uh, as a manor lord at the top of the labor hierarchy in the English countryside, Morton exploited the superficial social egalitarianism of May Day revels, extending the festivities. Blah blah blah. I don't like that paragraph. I'm going to switch to this one. This is about um, Morton's egalitarianism. Uh, The basis of scholarly assumptions about Morton's egalitarianism stems largely from the way in which he gains control of Marymount. By wresting control from its lieutenant after the original leaders abandoned the the unsuccessful Mount Wollaston for Virginia. Like much about Marymount, the standard assumption has been heavily influenced by Bradford's history, which implies Morton stole control of Mount Wollaston by aligning himself with the servants rather than the true rulers. Bradford's account of this event is noteworthy because it is one of the few times in which Bradford in of Plymouth Plantation breaks from the mold of his plain literary style and engages in self-aware rhetorical flourishes. Bradford records Morton seducing the indentured servants by telling them, quote, I, having a part in the plantation, will receive you as my partners and consociates, so may you be free from service, and we will converse, plant, trade, and live together as equals, and support and protect one another. But then adds in his own words, or to like effects. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, he's not he's not the perfect egalitarian, but no. you know what? He's making them nervous in the right ways. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> t- or, or, or. Um, though Morton makes no specific mention of how he became the leader of the renamed Marymount, he recognized the imminent dissolution of Mount Wollaston uh, if the few remaining indentured servants were called to Virginia and dismissed their indentures in return for their pledge to remain with him. Now in the midst of a newly liberated servants with no means of controlling them, Morton deftly avoided the plantation's devolution into anarchy by using the maypole to install an extended culture of revels, providing a superficial anarchy that subtly solidified his position not as master but as mine host. Well, anyway, the the, the point I want to make is that Morton actually did have some um, sort of working class solidarity. He gets exiled from uh, the... Americas a number of a couple times uh, and then one of these it says toward the end in 1630 when the Massachusetts Bay Court decided to send Morton back to England for the last time uh, they could not uh, quote either by fair means or foul end quote get any ship's crew to agree to take part in his exile back to England Morton um, and this is because uh, the sailors that had been hanging out at Marymount wouldn't take him back it's awesome which is like you know what? That's some. You got some uh, democratic power there. Yeah, yeah. Like you might not be perfect, but like that's some buy-in from the right. Like that's that's the right that's people a strike. need you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I I don't know I don't know if you have any closing thoughts on the Maple of Marymount. I thought it was somewhat. Um, I thought it was going to be a nice little introduction into Hawthorne's thought. It maybe soured me on him a little bit more uh, than I was expecting it to. I don't. You have a slightly different response. Um, I don't know if it soured me. I, yeah, I definitely prefer Scarlet Letter. I think it's mm-hmm. it's a little more complex. But I, I like the idea that I like what he's doing, which is like playing with symbols. Right. That it's and not not showing you. He kind of hints at what 
where his like sentiments may be as the author, whatever that even means, mm-hmm. but he's willing to leave it a, a little bit more inconclusive. And even like, you know, like the lack of central characters almost, he's like, he's not there to, I don't know. He's not there to like guide you through things. He's like, I'm going to present a bunch of information yeah, and I'm going to show you how things can shift over time really quickly without right. showing you my allegiance or what your allegiance should be. It's weird. It's like, you know, that, that's one of the sort of main tenets of Marxist criticism is do you show a society changing? Mm-hmm. And Hawthorne sort of does that in the least Marxist way possible. Yes. Yeah. Like, well, it's he, interesting. He seems, he, I think he must believe that, or he must, if there is anything that he's showing, it's that progress is inherently uh, negative, mm, possibly. Yeah. And I think that if you look at like, if this is supposed to be some prelapsarian story about before America is America from his point of view, he, you could very well like extrapolate some sort of like, yeah, America is doomed from the beginning. Right. And I don't want to get too much into his politics in this one. We'll mm-hmm. do that more in Scott Letter because I, I just want to do a bit more research. But he sucked on the, the Civil War. His basic arc, as far as I know, was like, he's like, this is a huge problem, but God will sort it out eventually. Yeah, that uh, sounds like him. Yeah. And then, um, but the one validating thing, and he, and generally bad, like I said. But I think this is also a, um, instructive for people who, 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 people on the left who basically just like to bash liberals is like equally as bad as fascists. Is once the Civil War was going and after the Emancipation Proclamation, he said, "Well, it's the one good reason to keep the war, keep fighting the war." Um, I believe that's right. If it's not, we'll correct it in the Scarlet Letter episode. Um, <laughs> Anyway, Alex, thank you very much for uh, this experiment. I think it went pretty well doing a full story. I don't know if this has been done in a podcast before, so probably in Guinness Book of World Records. Um, <laughs> we'll see how it goes when we do Moby Dick. Oh, yeah. Just like uh, hours. like Delaney. Uh, was it, uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy who's doing... Or was doing. Oh, was doing. Yeah, the uh, Rejoice. The rejoice, yeah. Yeah, he got to Chapter 10. Just a little, a little over fourth of the way in <laughs> what was his name again uh robert nah rob, rob this is so sad it wasn't bob delaney <laughs> i think it is robert delaney but isn't that but the comedian that's a comedian yeah <laughs> this is so, well he's dead well he's dead now yeah. and, the, and the podcast has stopped more importantly <laughs> <laughs> remember when he was like yeah i'll do finnegan's wake after this and it's like dude it's like dude i just hope you get like half done with yeah, this yeah. Yeah. anyway uh that's been uh, this edition of literary hangover thank you again alex for uh for uh stopping by it we're uh, recording this from casa uh the literary hangover hq actually we're not even in the majority report studios we're in if you you probably heard my cat a number of times uh throughout this uh this recording barnaby it's silent there you go um elks thank you very much yeah thank you all right